So welcome everybody um, to the, um, what is today? The February 17th meeting of the ETAC, Envision Eugene Technical Advisory Committee. I am the current chair, Tiffany Edwards. And I just want to welcome everybody. I feel like it's been a while. I like a like a not the normal amount of time that we go without seeing each other. So, um, just as a quick reminder, uh, we're we're meeting by Zoom. So for the for the viewing audience, we've been meeting by Zoom. Um, and so if you do have, oh, Sue is not getting audio. Okay. Um, well, let, let us try to work on that. But we are. Um, as a reminder, if you have, if you want to uh, chime in, have a comment or anything like that, just feel free to um, raise your hand in the in the panelist list. That's easiest for me, but I I can usually see you unless there's a screen share happening. Um, and try to keep your camera on and yourself on mute if you're not speaking. Uh, we're gonna I'm, I'm gonna go through the agenda real quick, and and then I'm gonna ask if anybody has any uh, changes or amendments that they would like to make. Um, the first thing we're going to go through, obviously, we're going to go through the minutes for a lot from um, the video from last the last meeting, and then we're going to the next thing on the agenda is the growth monitoring draft comprehensive report review, and Heather and Elena are going to walk us through that. And the sections that we have for today are the next steps and timeline, and then there, we're going to revisit the executive summary and then the recommendations and emerging emerging issues and outstanding questions list. And um, the first part we'll be going through, and they'll be taking us through the the track changes and clean version of the, the new revised uh, report. So we'll go through that. And then we also had had discussed. Uh, we're going to talk about the letter that would be um, Alyssa had written that would introduce the report. So we'll, we'll, we'll talk about that kind of at the end as well. And so does anybody have any questions or concerns about the agenda or anything they'd like to add? Nope, okay. So um, I'm gonna move on to the, ask for approval of the January 6th Zoom meeting summary. If everybody's had a chance to review that. And if so, if there are any changes or, or I guess you won't really change the video, but if you have anything to um, comment on or to accept the, otherwise, thank you, the John. Meeting. I'll second okay. that. Moved by John, seconded by Alexis. Uh, I'll go ahead and move, take, take a, a vote here. So all in favor of approving the minutes, go ahead and I can see this, so, okay. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, we have one abstention. Did I get everybody? Okay. I didn't, Sue didn't vote and I don't know if she can hear us. Oh, that's right. She's, she's not having, uh, she's having some issues with the sound. Okay. Um, I think we had enough to pass. That's fine. I was going to say maybe we can have, okay, she's still having issues. She will connect when she can. Okay. Maybe if someone can just have her keep us posted so that we know when she can, when she can actually hear us. All right. Close that chat. Okay. Um, do we have any members of the public who have come to make give public comment because I won't go through the spiel if not. Um, no, we do reserve maybe. that at the beginning of this meeting. So for those watching, you are always welcome at the beginning to make public comment. All right, I think we're ready for uh, item number two on the agenda. And we're gonna be spending the majority of the meeting on going through the um, draft report that's been revised. So Heather and Elena, I'm gonna kick it to you all. Great, I'm just gonna um, do a little presentation screen share here. Okay. 
So um, we're gonna jump. Can you all see the actual presentation or are you seeing the double? See your notes, Heather. That is yeah, we're seeing notes. the double. That's better. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Okay. So um, <clears throat> I know Tiffany just talked about this a little bit, but um, to give you a little bit more of an expansion on the on the rest of the agenda for tonight. Um, so as Tiffany talked about, we'll talk about the executive summary, the recommendations, and then the new emerging issues list that we tried to gather as we were um, reviewing the report. <clears throat> um, oh, I didn't add this, but um, we will also have um, the planning director um, uh, intro that we'll talk about at the end. Um, really, that's just to um, see if there's any additional items that um, if you were just opening this report for the first time and you would want to get the lay of the land, is there anything missing from um, Alyssa's introduction? Uh, after we go through that and get additional feedback from you all, um, we will, we have a slide that um, talks about some of the changes that we know that is coming to the that are coming to the report um, after ideally if if we end up um, voting today um, after that this is kind of a living document this is the first time we've done this um, it's draft as we talked about I think last time it's draft it, um, it'll go to planning commission as a draft still um, and there are some edits and um, they're not nothing big, but you know, there might be some tweaks to the um, planning director intro. Um, we're still working on some formatting issues with charts um, and, in, and there's a couple other data things that are pretty minor, but we just wanna flag those for you so that you know. Um, we've been talking about how there would be changes, um, but that they shouldn't be substantial. And so, um, and at least until it gets to planning commission and then they'll have their input in the report as well. Um, so there may be changes after that. So we just wanna make sure that you're aware of that. Um, ETAC recommendation and vote. And then we'll talk about next steps um, about how the report gets reviewed, continues through its review path, and then next steps for the ETAC and, um, and really the growth monitoring work for the remainder of the year essentially. Um, okay, so um, I'm going to stop sharing this in a second, um, but we have some prompts up here um, to talk about, to prompt us to think about what additional feedback you might have. Um, hopefully, you've already been thinking about it for those sections, but um, any additional feedback on these sections, we'll start with the executive summary, although we recognize that there's a lot of overlap between these. And so we might have to do a little bit of bouncing back and forth, which we've been doing already. Um, is the order of the report still working for everyone? We've had some conversations about that. Um, so these are some of the prompts. Are any of the revisions that we made um, substantially different than you expected? Is there anything missing that you thought there was agreement on that we didn't capture? Um, and then finally, any items that might need to be, you know, that the group would think, you know, well, I expected that to be in the recommendation section, not in the emerging issues or vice versa. Um, we did give a lot of thought about how to kind of tease those things out, what's a recommendation versus an emerging issue, um, but I, you know, there may be some conversation about that. So I'm going to stop sharing. And um, I thought what I would do is put up the... Um, 
Word version, the track changes version of the report for your conversation, um, but I can certainly go back and forth. It's a little bit tricky, so you may have it up on your screen, but um, the Word version has, you know, in the comment bubbles, how, uh, what the ETAC, ETAC feedback was, and then how we tried to address it um, or didn't and why. And so um, I think that's probably a good place to start if that works for everyone. I'm gonna share my screen. Okay. Um, and before, Tiffany, before I hand it over, can you all um, see this okay? Do I need to make the it a little bit bigger? Probably bigger. John's doing this, so bigger. I know I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> Big, bigger, bigger. How's that, John? You need to get yourself some reading glasses. <laughs> Is that better? That. How's that? Okay. Okay. We got, we have Sue. Audio is working. So, yay. That's good. Okay, great. Okay. So, I'm going to mute and then Tiffany, I'll let you, I'll kick it back over to you. Okay. So, what we, I think what we want to do here is we just kind of want to go through and I'm going to ask folks for, to raise your hand if you have anything to, to make a comment on. I, I will admit it's hard for me to look at the track chains version version. So what I did was I, I actually just took the clean, the new clean version and did most of my, you know, I had very few things to incorporate, but I think um, if everybody's okay with that approach, um, I think that that, that would make sense. Um, I'm happy to put on the clean version. This might actually be pretty hard to read. I, um, what? What does everybody think? What do you all find it easier? I've got the clean version on one screen and then I've got Heather sharing on another, but I have three screens. So not everybody has that. So I, I've got a lot of things happening. Um, does anybody have an issue? It does, okay, Sue's got her hand raised. I'll let Sue chime in and let us know. What do you think, Sue? Uh, okay, well, I like seeing the um, annotated version personally because I like seeing the process of what's happened so far. And okay. because, because I missed the whole first part, I just wanna say, I am so happy that Ed is back. Whew. Okay, there we go. <laughs> hey. Yes, Ed, you were very missed for even just the one meeting, so. All right, I'm watching the hands to see if, if folks have stuff. So I, I see Kevin, it, Kevin, Sue's hand is still up, but I'm guessing that's from before. And so I've got Kevin, you wanna go ahead and start. Yeah, so, so this isn't a, um, a fatal kind of concern, but if I stepped back, um from what a year and a half of etac membership and deep dive into all this stuff and it looked at this document as if it was the first time i read it um the executive summary we go from an introductory letter uh, which talks about envision eugene at a very very high level and then it's like boom it just dives kind of like right into all this sort of data, um, the, kind of the results of all the work that was done. And it's kind of a summary of the results. But it it's a little jarring to me. And I wanted to just raise the question of whether this kind of executive summary ought to follow the introduction, which is currently on page like 15. Um, and uh, so people get a sense, well, what is growth monitoring? Why is it important? Those, I mean, I thought the introduction was actually really good, well, well written. Um, and it gives context to all this data. And then 
the the data summary i'd almost call it <laughs> rather than executive summary data summary um would follow this and then it gets and then for people that want to really get into all the stuff then that would all follow um alternatively i actually <laughs> i copied the executive summary to a fresh document and tried to boil it down to like three pages by capturing all the bold stuff out of the uh, clean text. Um, but I, de I really defer to staff to know and have a sense of um, how important all the qualifications are, because um, that's kind of the stuff that I took out uh, to make it really a summary. Um, but uh, the, again, the, the, my first preference may be to just leave it as it is with whatever input others have, but shift it downwards so that when someone picks this up, they've read the introduction. And you know, what is growth monitoring and why is it important? Oh. Kevin, thank you for um, kind of introducing that, that, that issue. We, we did speak a little bit about this and um, I would love to get others thoughts. And I know Howard has his hand raised. And then I, I thought of something while before the meeting that I'll that I'll inter in interject afterwards. So go ahead, Howard. Yeah, I um, um, Kevin stole my my thunder. I had uh, a kind of a similar thought as far as um, the report. It immediately launches into um, a, dis a summary discussion of all the data, rather than really inter introducing what the growth monitoring plan is, why it's important, and all that. So. In that regard, I concur with what Kevin's saying is that really this report really needs to start with the introduction of of um, why growth monitoring is important and, and the elements so that the reader at least gives an idea of what they're about ready to read. So um, I, I would suggest staff uh, uh, consider uh, maybe reformatting or reorganizing the report a little bit, I think would be very helpful, especially to those that um, are new to the subject or, you know, haven't necessarily been engaged in, in the whole growth monitoring uh, concept. Thanks. Thanks, Howard. Um, my thought it, along the same lines, because I actually, I understand absolutely what, what Kevin was referring to and, um, I mentioned that you know those of us who are so close to this work, we automatically know what we're reading. But um, if to a layperson or somebody else, now I'm not assuming that like any old layperson's going to pick this up and want to dive right in. But um, I, my thought was maybe there was a way to put a little bit more context into the letter, and so that was my thought: was is there a way to introduce it in a little bit of a better way that that could be incorporated into with Alyssa's words? um if that was an, a thought but i would love to hear others opinion and thoughts about whether or not we think that we need some sort of context at the beginning before the executive before jumping right into the executive summary would we find that help, helpful um so i'd love any others who who happen to maybe agree or are leaning towards uh howard and kevin's um input Well, I guess I guess I'll weigh in. <clears throat> um, I'm kind of thinking about it the similar to what Tiffany said. Who's going to be reading this report, right? Who who actually is going to read it and use it to help guide policy or other types of decisions that need to be made with the upcoming urban growth analysis and those types of things. Um, it's such a large document that the executive summary is eight pages long, right? So if we add more to that, and this is just my, just my reading of it. If I've got an executive summary that's eight pages long and I'm thinking of adding more stuff at the beginning of it, I might not even make it through those eight pages because it's long. And I, I, I understand the, 
the wanting it to be read by the average citizen. And I think that that is good, but maybe we can, can dive into it a little bit more in the one or two page letter from Alyssa and, and you know, executive summaries are supposed to boil it down. So that's where I'm leaving. Okay, thanks, John. So I've got Dennis and then Ed. Feel free to. Yeah, as the newest person to this process, who's you know probably closest to you know your average lay leader, um, as I've been telling staff, I'm I'm beginning to grok what's going on here. I agree with the general sentiment of some piece of overview. I mean, just that sense of that this monitoring is one of the pillars of the Envision Eugene process. Um, you know, so is you know. Um, climate change and energy resiliency is also a pillar. Um, so I think putting it in that larger context, because it's like when we get to the end of emerging issues, I want to, you know, look to staff to how does this report address particular issues of, of uh, CAP 2.0, the climate plan. Um, and, you know, which is as the Sustainability Commission member is my priority when I look at this report. Um, so I think a bit more context, um, and I agree with the notion of not making the summary longer would be helpful. Where does it fit in the Envision Eugene process for people who are wading into it at a different point um, than people who have been looking at the detail side for a long time? Because I'm particularly looking at some of the contact development strategies in CAP 2.0. How does this report provide data on how we're doing on those goals? Um, so um, I think that's, the, I guess the point of all this is, you know, I agree with those who are advocating for a little more context up front. Okay, thanks, Dennis. Uh, Ed and then Mark. I'm thinking about maybe adding one sentence to the executive summary, referring to the introduction and how to use the report. That's it. Like a sentence before launching in that's just like a, so not necessarily in the letter, but you could we could just do, could that sentence be part of Alyssa's letter, do you think? Maybe, you know, just notifying who's reading the report that okay. the introduction and how to, how to read the report is available on a certain page. Okay. Seems almost too simple of an idea. <laughs> anyway, that's, that's a great idea, Ed. Uh, Mark, go ahead. Yeah, my, my thought is that the, I think the executive summary is a, appropriate as it is. That is the depth and the eight pages doesn't concern me in part because it is so well divided with headings and subheadings that anyone looking for certain information can readily find <coughs> it. And so that, that aspect is not of concern to me. And I think, I think it's good uh, in having the depth that it does have at, at the length that it is. I do think that it would be helpful to have uh, in some form, either the introduction itself precede it or some addition to the letter. Uh, and so that, that part I think makes a lot of sense, but the point Kevin was making, uh, but I, I'd be reluctant to, to try to trim the executive summary um, just because I, I, find it, I find it, you know, ideal the way it is because it, provides the, it does provide the right amount of uh, key points plus backup information. And it's the, the kind of key points that, that we're all, or at least I, I think a lot of people would be looking for. Another, another point is that it wouldn't bother me at all for the executive summary to follow the introduction. Uh, if that's a, a, a streamline or a, an appropriate smooth way to, to get there, even though it's called executive summary, I don't see any need for it necessarily to precede the introduction. So that's, that's not a concern of mine in part because anybody or well, the introduction can, could refer to the executive summary coming right up. But so I, I, think, I think that would be the, at least that's the take I have on, on the current situation. Okay, I think that was everybody. Um, 
I'm just going, I'm, I'm looking for the, so, rec so it goes executive summary recommendations and then table of contents. And then we start with the introduction and how to use this report. And there is background information as well. So, you know, I mean, so, cause it has the, it has the introduction and then it has why a growth monitor, why is growth monitoring important and background. Um, I think I'm still leaning towards I think that I like where this is here because it's it it pre it preludes the the report, um, and it, this is talking about the report, how to use this report, and then the background info. I think what I think would make sense if you know just my opinion is I think it would make sense to put something into the letter to try to uh, put a little bit of context as to what. Um, you know the what 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 the growth monitoring really is she talks about you know it will adjust over the years but i don't think that it that that you would know anything you you if you didn't already know you might be lost in 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 some of the parts that she's um i don't know i'm torn here cuz i do, i just don't think that we need a whole i I don't know that we need to move the section, um, but I do think that maybe adding just a, a sentence or two that introduces it might be sufficient. Kevin, go ahead. I I, I think Ed's um, suggestion is brilliant. Um, and that we direct people who aren't familiar with growth monitoring to page 15 or whatever it is, uh, where you can learn about the introduction and you know what is growth monitoring and why is it important um see page 15. thanks okay how does everybody feel about that do you want to do a straw poll i think it would be great but we probably should add an appendices to that sentence All right, who, can I just get a thumbs up if folks are okay with just adding a sentence um, to talk about referring folks to the introduction? I can't see you all, so I'm gonna have to, okay. It looks like everybody, okay. So Heather and Elena, you got, you got, you got that? Okay. Okay, well done. So the next topic that we kind of brought up and Kevin talked about it was the brevity or shortening or you know kind of the length of the ex executive summary do we feel I I tend to um I tend to agree with Mark um I think that it's actually to me it was the perfect amount of detail because it's very easy to understand and to read it's bolded it's it's uh he, there's he, subheads um and so I, you know, I couldn't think of anything that, that was like, oh, we don't need to, we don't need this. But I would love to hear from others as far as whether, you know, you know, we want to try to trim this down to three or four pages, or if the eight pages is really where the content is, and we kind of should keep stick with that. Sue. So I, I think because the report is so complex anyway, um, Personally, and maybe because you know I'm more familiar than the public might be with the content, I thought the executive summary was fantastic. I especially liked how, I mean, I, I felt that there wasn't too much information, but the information was accessible. And for anybody who wants to delve deeper, they could go way into the appendices and the charts and all. But I, I personally felt like it was just the right amount of information, um, and it's complicated. You know, it's not, it's not easy. And I, I sometimes wonder how many people are actually really going to be reading this besides us. Um, and hopefully, if if there are a bunch of people, they're motivated enough to really understand what's happening. But I think the summary was really outstanding. 
Go ahead, John. Yeah, I agree. I think that that the uh, when I was talking about the length of the summary, I was just talking about documents as a whole. I think this one was done exceedingly well. And the one thing that I'm really happy about is that sometimes with the executive summaries, you can pick out little things and run with them, right? But this has uh, references to the charts and the data that back everything up. So you can't just take a sentence out and say, oh, our medium in income is this much higher and run with that. It, ha it, it, it Even in the executive summary, it points you to where the documentation of all of that and how we got to some of the recommendations and stuff are. And I think that's very important because it's it's very easy to take little pieces of data and use them for whatever purpose you want to use that data for. But if the the corresponding backing up of that data is available, I think that's very important to have. So I think it's done well. Okay. Anyone else have thoughts on something other than what's been said? So if not, we can move on. Um, I think I, I think what might make sense is just to go through the sections and and have anybody you know through the pages or whatnot. And if there are anything, if there's anything in the so we're looking at the track changes version. I'm also looking at the final version. It's a little cleaner and easier. And that was what I went off of. I'm, I'm assuming that regardless of the version that you went from, if you have anything to bring up or add or ask a question about, it, it won't really matter how we approach it. Does that, does that sound okay if we just kind of go through sections and just make sure that we're all, that there, we, we, we're not missing anything. We've adequately addressed, you know, what that section is. So I think that that's probably Heather. Go ahead. Um, I think I can't raise my hand when I'm sharing my screen. So thanks for seeing my physical hand. Um, uh, I somebody made the comment. I think it was Kevin about um, potentially changing the name of the section to data summary. And um, I will admit, when we first titled it executive summary and we hadn't written it yet, I was certainly not thinking it was going to be eight pages long. And so um, we we could change it to summary. Um, just call it, you know, summary. Um, and I don't know if that would help folks because I think there is some expectation when you read an executive summary that it's going to be short. Um, and in the context of a couple hundred pages, eight is short, but um, it might not feel that way. So anyway, I just throw that out there as um, a thought of something we could consider. Sue, do you want to go respond to that? Yeah, I, I still think that most people think of an executive summary as someplace that they want to go right away. And I so I think calling it an executive summary is still important. Um, when I think about reports I've read, I mean, that's where I want to go first. And if it's called something else, they might not think it's an executive summary. So I don't know. That's just my perception. I will agree with that. Um, I, I, I've never under, I've never been under the impression that the, an executive su summary had to be extremely brief, but, um, but I do have expectations that it's going to summarize everything. Um, so I don't see an issue with keeping it unless there are others that feel strongly and I'm looking for hands cause I can see them all. Okay. So population section, we got, we're good on that. No chain, no, no, no comments there. Okay. Do do we want to scroll down, Heather, and we can just get to the job growth section and then. All right. Job growth. There was one. I, Go ahead. I, actually, I, I just had one quick comment around maybe having like one sentence, uh, and this might be now two sentences, since we already suggested having one sentence before this. Um, but 
just describing like the sections that are below, like we have population, job growth, et cetera. Um, just so people aren't seeing like population standalone as a standalone section, they kind of get a summary of sections from the get-go, but just thought. I see what you're saying. So the, the, the headers that are covered that go from population, job growth, uh, wages and pay, demographics, housing costs. How many are there? New housing, housing development incentives, housing land, employment development, employment land, employment development incentives, updated buildable land supply. And, and maybe there's a way to do it without going through well, every single. Yeah, that's it's not too many. And then updated land supply compared to updated demand. I don't know what do people think about that, or do you feel like do you feel like we almost need like a table of contents for the executive summary? Or I don't I don't see it to be. You could super certainly simple. say, um, you know, uh, that the section below provides a summary of things from from population and job growth all the way to. Um, building permits and re you know and i'm not going to say rerunning our land supply but you know just kind of instead of listing them all but yeah um the breadth of right yep or there okay. you could possibly put population and then in parentheses put the pages that it corresponds to next to it or below you know that are down in the in the uh index below just oh i see what you're saying well wait no i don't see what you're saying john are you saying so, so in the population section uh -huh. if you look down in the in the right. table of contents it says population is on page 23 through 26 or whatever and, and you can do the same for employment metrics. Those are page 54 to 58 or whatever, those types of things. That's just an idea. Okay, so you're, I think you're talking about something slightly different, but I could be wrong. So you're talking about in that parentheses area to draw, to, to specify the page numbers in the, um, in the appendix. Is that what Alex was appendix. trying to get at? Well, I think what Alexis was saying was that at the beginning, beginning at the executive summary when you're starting to go into it like talk about here's what it, we're going to cover and have the different sections introduced before you have to go into each one and so maybe a sentence or two and then yeah. what heather said was that what if we just summarized it by saying you know below we've covered everything from population and you know that and then to job growth to just kind of more higher level summarizing that, but without listing them off as if they were almost like a table of contents. Okay, I misunderstood. Um, but when we talk about changes to this report, um, there are certainly things like that that we can add. Um, you know, sometimes we just like right here, we just say appendix. Um, once we have the order, solidified, which I think we're pretty close, um, we can put the appendix um, number in there, we can, or letter, we can put page numbers, we can start doing some of those final things that will help um, people get to the data more quickly. Okay, yeah, I think that's a I think that's a good idea. I'm gonna let Dennis has his hand raised. Go ahead, Dennis. Yeah, just back to that whole section of a, a lead in. I think that the version Heather talked about, about, you know, an introduction that says this is a multi, you know, factored um, summary, including things from this to this. Um, I think that would be helpful. Yeah. Okay, should we go through the sections then? And then we can just move on after we get through the executive summary. I think I think um, I will just say I read through it and I had one qu question. It was more of a question than a comment. And so I thought it was excellent and it was really well summarized and 
everything made sense to me. But again, I've been doing this for a few years. So I am kind of used to seeing um, what we're talking about. So I, I try to think about it in terms of someone who hasn't. Um, we're down at job growth. Anybody have anything to chime in on about job growth? Moving down to wages and pay, which is short. Any comments there? Sue, do you have your hand up new? Yeah. Okay, sorry. <laughs> I do. Yeah, I do. Um, I, this was the only place that confused me a bit. Um, the combination of talking about the Alice formula and uh, other economic terminology, I, I, I thought that first paragraph was just a little bit confusing and I had to read it two or three times to kind of understand. So I may be the only one, but uh, in the third sentence or so, however, according to the Alice report, 28% of Lane County residents earned above the federal poverty level, but still not enough to afford a bare bones budget, blah, blah, blah. For a total of 45% of households earning a, below the Alice threshold, I don't know. Maybe it's because uh, there is so much terminology included in this particular part, and I think it's all important, but I, I did have to read it three or four times to kind of, and I still not sure. I'm, like, I'm not sure 100 percent that I understand it. I think I do. Uh, if it's possible to simplify that in any way, I think that'd be great. But honestly, I'm not attached. So if I can um, just clarify what that means, and then we can certainly work on this. Um, I think this got comments last time. Um, so that um, there's the, the percentage of the population that is um, experiencing poverty. And then the Alice threshold says, yeah, but that's actually too low of a threshold. Um, there's more people that don't have, so that earn above the poverty level um, and still don't have enough to afford these things. And so even though the poverty level um, was 28%, um, and I don't have, I don't know, what is it? 26 to 28%, uh, above that up to 40, together the poverty level plus the, the folks that can't, earn enough to um, meet a bare bones budget, those together make up 45% of Lane County. Um, so, so obviously I'm also not doing a very good job of even articulating it if I have to use my hands. Um, so we can definitely work on that some more. Um, it's trying to say that poverty isn't the only thing that we should look at. There's actually folks that are making more than the federal poverty level that still can't afford um, what the Alice analysis considers a bare bones um, household budget. And it's pretty high. I mean, that's 45% of our households meet that threshold of not being able to um, have a bare bones household budget. So um, duly noted, um, we can definitely work on the language there. Okay. I see what you're saying though, Sue, for sure. Um, sorry. Okay. So anything else on the wages and pay? Oh, Dennis, you have your hand up. Yeah, I was wavering whether or not uh, what uh, Heather was saying kind of addressed what Sue brought up. I had the same sense. I had to read it a couple of times, but when I read it a couple of times, I found it very clear. Um, and because it is sort of a startling piece when such a high percentage of our community can't meet those bare bones needs. And that was part of my difficulty with it was reacting to the reality of the data. 
Um, so I thought when I did read it twice, it was clear. Um, it did explain itself, um, even though it took a couple of reads to get it. Um, and maybe you're right, Heather, some language that says a high proportion of our community is economically challenged and has difficulty meeting bare bones. This many poverty, this many, uh, you know, don't meet the Alice standards for that, you know, combined figure. Uh, maybe combined figure first and then going into the what makes up that 45% of households um, who, you know, can't meet a bare bones budget. Uh, might be a different approach, but uh, um, it's good data. It's good data that I think more people in our community should be aware of this reality. So, um, you know, at any rate, um, Sue, good point. Um, and Heather, I think your sense of, you know, playing with the language is a very good direction to go. Okay, I'm, uh, y'all, I'm having an issue with my computer deciding it needs to shut down. So I'm about to log in on a different computer. So I will be, you will see two of me momentarily, but we'll continue on. Um, Let's get let's go to the demographics section if we don't have any other comments on wages and pay. Anything there? Nobody? Okay. How about housing costs? You have something to bring up on this next section under new housing. I think it's under new housing. Let me just make sure here. Um, yeah, there was a second paragraph from the bottom there where it talks about the buildable low density residential land supply not having services to be able to annex, which is 40%. And then the percentage of the buildable residential land supply being located on steeper lands, which is 57%. My, in my mind, I'm reading that going, that's 97%. It, but I'm guessing they're not intended to be like cumulative. And so um, I don't know if there's a way to remedy that. I just, um, I, I, I saw that and I thought I might just bring that up just as something that sounds like if you're reading it for the first time, you're thinking, well, that basically is telling me that 97% of our, our inventory has a problem and um, that didn't seem right to me. So I'll just bring that up. Recording in progress. Sorry guys, I'll mute myself for a second here. Okay, how about Kevin and then Ed? Let me put mute, sorry. You're muted, Kevin. Thank, thank you. Um, the second sentence sort of threw me. Um, new housing has been keeping pace with the population growth over the modern period. Um, And that sounds like, oh, things are great. Um, and, and maybe I'm, I'm, I'm not jibing or with, you know, the situation that we have a, 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 an absurd real estate market right now and rents are going up. Uh, the value of homes are going up crazy because we don't have enough housing. And so, um, that that to lead off with that sentence, there are a lot of qualifications later, and I think that's what you're scrolling down to. But it, it sounds like, you know, this is an executive summary. We've built 8,000 new dwellings and, you know, we're good and keeping pace. And I, I think um, that just seemed odd to me. 
Yeah, we struck or I struggled with that in a number of cases where it's like you want to go technically when you look at the totals, it seems like, you know, we're on pace for total number of dwellings. But then when you look, when you break it down and you look at, um, you know, like this, um, however, when you look at the specific housing types, so much of it has been multifamily. Or when you look at the different plan designations, not very much of it has been on low density residential. So yeah, I um, hear what you're saying and maybe there's a way to say, um, I don't know. If you look at housing overall, this is happening, but the following talks about, you know, or, or identifies some of the caveats that come with this statement or something like that, that is, because we do try in general in the report, we try to start with the overarching data and then break it down. And so we tried to follow that format in the executive summary, but, um, this is almost too pithy, you know, it's almost too short, <laughs> which I am not known for, so. Okay, I don't remember who was next. Was it, I think it either Ed or John, I apologize, I'm back. I think, it, I, think I had it. Uh, since, Tiffany, since Tiffany brought up the percentages, I just wanted you to know that I do have some comments on those, but I don't think the executive summary is the right place to bring them up. So I'll hold them to later. Go for it, John. Yeah, um, I might be going to the same place that you're going, Ed. Um, so if I look at the sentence that Tiffany brought up, the slower production of lower density lands and single family housing is likely due in part to the percentage of buildable low density residential land, not having services or on slopes. I think there's other factors that are dealing with why we're not getting as much. Um, and, and this may be, go down to emerging issues, but there's buildable lands in our inventory that aren't getting built because of the way some of our codes and special area studies are written. I'm, I'm thinking particularly of the Royal Node. Um, you know, there's 60 acres out there that is on flat and surface that's not being developed because from what I understand from people, it's like you just can't get it built because the way the, the code's written. Or we're not seeing subdivisions uh, and PUDs being put in because of the, the cost that it has as far as appeals and, and those types of things. So I don't think it needs to go into the executive summary, but it might go into that box down at the end that we're talking about of emerging issues of how come some of our land inside the urban growth boundary that does have services, that is flat, that isn't getting built on because of some other regulatory uh, prescriptions. Um, I've got Sue next. Can you go back to that uh, second sentence there that Kevin pointed out? Because I highlighted that as well. Yeah, um, I just want um, uh, John, if you could look at this while we're going to Sue's point, um, then we can come back. So. So um, I too found that sentence a little bit jarring because I know that in some segments, it's just simply not the case. So it seems to me like there's a way to <clears throat> address that with, by saying something like in general, in large numbers, in gross numbers, new housing has kept pace with the population growth up in the mind. However, specific segments have not matched population growth, something, I mean, something to alert people because it's, the information is in there later on. I mean, it's there, but uh, something to alert them that this is not a rosy picture in a lot of ways. So that's my suggestion. 
Dennis, go ahead. Yeah, I want to support that notion about alerting in that section, but I also want to come back to that piece about the, you know, the 40% and, you know, 50 some that adds up to 93. I wonder if the simple solution is to simply put in a period, drop the and and make it two separate sentences. So it doesn't appear to be as likely to be, you know, an addition there because we lose the and. Um, so that one to me would be a lot clearer with that kind of a simple edit on that part. Does that make sense? That was that piece about 50% steeper land and 40% uh, 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 yeah. uh, you know, not annex. If it was simply yeah. two sentences, I think it would read better. Okay. Any other comments on this section? I know this was kind of a, a lot of discussion. Um, can I ask Heather or Elena, what, I mean, so if the 50, if the 57 plus the 40 don't, don't add, you know, aren't intended to be cumulative, how does, how is that? Is it because, so what else is there then? I guess I'm asking is because um, then you would have to assume then that um, what what's what's not being what's not being introduced in that sentence that would actually contribute to uh, the other reasons? Because if you got forty percent, that means that there's another sixty percent out there that has some other. Or that's just built. Okay, actually, I'm, I'm I'm answering my own question here. Sorry. Wait, it moved. I'm gonna work on pulling this up. Okay. So I just jumped ahead um, to where you know we're pulling these figures up from below. So residential lands, 40% of those are unannexed. That's just like a standalone amount um, because it was important to get that information. But we also felt it was important to get the information about how many acres um, were less than 5% slope and how many were um, 5% or greater slope, again, to look at that steepness issue. Um, and then we also have it by lot size to really get at how much of the land supply is large lots um, versus smaller lots um, because of the different, you know, amount of development potential I think there is um, with larger lots. Not that that's something that, you know, that, but that's, you know, it's just to kind of understand what the development potential of your, um, your land supply is. So that's where those numbers are coming. Okay. Yeah. Let's get uh, Jennifer Ye, she's trying to come over. Do we pull her over as a panelist? Okay, I just want to make sure you saw that. Okay, I think I'm finally finally getting set up here. Um, all right, what's the next section? Housing development incentives. I don't think this is where I had another comment. Um, what page are we on? Okay, no. Anybody have any feedback on this section, housing development incentives? Okay. I just I just have one question. Um, and I'm okay. sure it's in, in here somewhere. Heather can scroll down to it when I ask my question. Um, when you talk about the MOPD program has been yet last utilized since it was revised in 2013. Um, is there a jump to 
those changes and why we think that it has been less utilized? I mean. No, um, because I think um, I think some of those why questions um, are need further review than just doing the bean counting that we're doing right here. So what monitoring doing is doing is saying, hey, um, how many dwellings have we seen with MUPTI? And then we're able to see this um, date divider with before when it was the earlier program and now. Um, and then I think that there's um, another, and so I can't, I'll have to look if this is, um, yeah, there, there is in um, either emerging issues or in the recommendations, this acknowledgement that we need to do more analysis, not just not monitoring, but actual analysis of our incentive tools, um, because it's not just MUPTI, it's a bunch of them, especially our employment one uh, efficiency measures that um, weren't used, haven't been used very much. And that could be, you know, because of what's been going on, but, um, but there could be other reasons. And so those take a deeper dive than, than just monitoring on what the numbers are. Right, and that's what I'm hoping is that they, that they showed up somewhere else. I, I think emerging issues would be the place to, to do that, saying that you know we've got efficiency measures that we thought were gonna work. It looks like the only one that's really working is well, and this is in, in employment, is the enterprise zone is the one that's really been the one that's been the most successful of all of ours. And so at some point digging into which ones work and why will be a good idea. Yeah, so I was I was wrong. It's in the recommendations. So this could be a good conversation, but um, but it, it does feel like, a, yeah, I mean, it could be an emerging issue, but I think it has emerged. And so I don't, <laughs> it kind of feels like it is a recommendation that um, we should continue monitoring the effectiveness. We have housing efficiency strategies, and then we have the same one for employment efficiency strategies. Um, so monitoring them, which we will, we have to do, we're doing that anyway, but then also um, evaluating that as part of the next UGB analysis, um, if that's the case that they still are or aren't being successful, doing a deeper dive on those. Okay. Are we ready to move on to the next section? How's, are we, is that where we are, housing land? Yeah. Okay, any, any, I'm only, I'm down to two screens instead of three, so I'm trying to figure out where everything is. Okay. I uh, don't have any hands up on housing land, so no, no comments there. Employment development and employment land. Anything? Okay, moving on to employment development incentives. Um, we did get some comments from Phil Farrington. Um, okay. He made a suggestion that we make it clear. It not I don't know if it needs to be here, but at least in the report where there are um, efficiency measures or incentives that are not fully funded. So as an example, um, talk about brownfield sites. Uh, that there is a program for not seeing here it is the program for brownfield the brownfield assessment program and used all the money that we were awarded for grants for um, the brownfield assessment program so we are planning on reapplying but that we could just add some footnotes um, maybe here and in the appendix that Here's the efficiency measures that um, 
aren't just a given kind of. Um, so that's one of them. I think SDCs is another one because some of our SDC credits actually have a cap um, on how much development, on how high they can go. Um, so just noting that. Okay. Anything else on that section? Yes, then we can move on to updated buildable lands supply. I had a question of the on this section. When I read these percentages to, uh, at the bottom of the, these bulleted percentages that said that 54% of the residential vacant and partially vacant land supply is on lots less than five acres. Okay. So is that saying that the other 46% are on lots larger than five acres? Is that what we're saying? Okay. Does that seem like a lot? And I thought, where are these five acre lots? But I, I mean, I guess it's relative. So. Um, Royal Avenue. Okay, yeah. Then that makes sense. I just thought, I found that hard to believe. I was like, within the UGB, there's all these, this, all this land that's more than five acres that, and that's where the, the buildable supply is, which, okay. okay. I think the Crow Road area is another one. Yep. Um, but there is a link to the BLI web maps in the report. So if you want to go fly around the UGB and check out where those large lots are, um, feel free in your spare time. <laughs> I think there was another question I had having to do with the, uh, something with the, I think it was in this section and it was the unannexed, un um, Maybe this was what it was. The buildable land supply is unannexed. So in addition to the Clear Lake UGB expansion area, there's a, a, a big um, swath of, of buildable land that is not is unannexed. Okay. And that's largely in Santa Clara area, or is that all over? Yeah, it's all over. A lot, again, a large part of it is the Crow Road area um, because okay. it doesn't have the capital um, improvements for right. to be able, yeah, it doesn't have utilities extended. To it. That is a big part of it. Okay. Okay, those were my just questions that stood out for me on that section. But if nobody else has anything to add or mention, we can move on to the updated land supply compared to updated demands section. Let me, we're getting, we're, this is it, this is the end. This is the last little subsection and then we're on to recommendations. Yeah, I don't. I mean, I, I I just think that these are two of the sections that were, um, when this process started, these were two of the areas that were the most contentious um, when when setting the UGB parameters, um, and so I think these two are they're clear, but they're also going to be the ones that are I think looked at and, and again, where I said, the uh, ability to cherry pick things out, uh, making sure that when somebody asks a question, uh, especially the policymakers, Heather, scroll down for them too, <laughs> so that they see where these numbers are from and, and not be able to just say, well, we need, uh, we need this many more dwelling sites uh, and explain that they're there, we just need to, Get the infrastructure to them or whatever the, the answer to that is but i think these two sections are the ones that people are going to gravitate toward can you 
Ed, I, I called on you. You have your hand up. Yes, thank you. Um, I still don't think the executive summary is the place for me to bring up two or three issues that I have. It's, it's later on in, in the report, but it does deal with what we're talking about now. So I'll wait for the appropriate time. Well, I, I mean, I, I would say, you know, we, the executive, we're revisiting the executive summary because we would have already looked at those sections of the report. And so the executive summary is supposed to be the key points from later in the report. And so if, you know, um, have concerns about, yeah, then it I think it would be good to mention. Yeah. Okay, let, let me go ahead and bring it up now. And it has to do with the Crow Road area and the lack of infrastructure. And since we're doing this report on a five-year basis, it seems to me that it would be a lot more accurate for the Crow Road area to be included into the BLI when the infrastructure is within that five-year period of being installed. Right now, after reading through the report and everything like I did today, I feel like the Crow Road area is really constrained like the Willow Creek area was during the original Envision Eugene. So I'm questioning if the Crow Road, the BLI, should even be in the BLI at this point until the infrastructure that's going to allow it to be developed is a lot closer to being done. And I don't think it's gonna be in the next five years or even in the next 10 years. I'm not even sure it's on the capital improvement list. So it just appears to me that the best time to include Crow Road into the BLI would be when the infrastructure is actually planned for and is going to happen. Until then, I think it's constrained and shouldn't be in the BLI. And I didn't realize that until going through the report today. So I don't want to throw a curveball all of a sudden, but that's what I'm thinking. So if I can just respond. Um, so yeah, this has been a challenge, right? All along with the planning. Um, when we did it the first time, we separated out which land inside the UGB um, had services and which land didn't um, because statutes require us to include all land inside the UGB. It doesn't matter if it's um, served or not. We have to assume as long as it's in your um, it's in your um, plans, your long-term facilities plans, which Crow Road is to be served, then you have to include the capacity on it in your buildable lands inventory. Um, so we have tried to note Crow Road in here a lot because it is a big part of our um, capacity. And in the recommendations, there are recommendations about um, providing services to housing and employment capacity. So we have those in the recommendations, but we can't not include those areas in the BLI unless we're gonna say that they're not able to be served. And so that's, we're not doing that conversation right now. That would be part of the UGB analysis. At this point, we're just saying, what's the buildable land according to the state statute um, that still remains in the BLI? And, and so, we have to include it. So the difference between Crow Road and Willow Creek is there's no plans to serve Willow Creek correct? So Willow Creek, when we had that out separately, um, we didn't say it wasn't going to be served. What we, we included Willow Creek and other areas that get as constrained um, or not. I don't even think we said constrained. We just said they were without services to acknowledge that um, we're counting this land, but just like we've tried to do here, there is a segment of our land that we have to count for the statutes, but it's actually not served and not annexed yet. And so 
there needs to be an awareness of um, like you were saying that it get, that it's not going to develop right away until there are plans to serve it or until it does get served. So if there aren't there aren't any areas other than areas that were protected um, that we said we couldn't serve in the last UGB analysis. Um, because arguably, if you can't serve an area that's in your UGB, you, sh you might consider taking it out of your UGB um, because the state statutes are clear that you have to um, plan to serve all of your land that is inside the UGB. So I think what we're trying to get at, Ed, though, is the distinction you are, which is that we have land that's considered buildable and yet it doesn't have services yet. So that's that's highlighting um, for policymakers a discussion that they can have about where services, where we where services should go next. Yeah, we're a little bit constrained. We're constrained. <laughs> we're constrained by the state statutes about what we can and can't count capacity on. Dennis, you have your hand up. Yeah, I think that that's a good point in terms of the sense of the constraints that come from, you know, the state requirements. And in a similar vein, I think the sentence that's, you know, added about additionally the state's recent revisions to analysis rules around climate friendly and equitable opportunities likely to change. Um, that may make it less um, likely that there will be a focus on lands that are farther from the urban core. So we just need to recognize in this periodic analysis that there will be some variable factors that come from the state level. Um, the current rules and some likely revisions that may make pressure on, uh, um, you know, there may be pressure counter incentives to develop, you know, lands more distant from the urban core both around climate issues and housing equity issues. So um, I think that there's a prior, you know, section of that that's wait and see what the state does. I mean, you know, so um, I appreciate Heather that you talk about that sense of just acknowledge we are constrained um, and maybe somewhere in the language, you know, we are constrained by state rules uh, might be appropriate. Okay, so Ed, you mentioned a couple things. Was that pr pretty, that was the bulk of it? There wasn't anything else before we? I'll, I'll go ahead and hit a couple, but not really part of the executive summary. Okay. Uh, well, one thing that I, I, I do not doubt the figures at all, but one thing I cannot wrap my head around is the fact that single family density increased, um, because mainly because of the new stormwater regs. I can go into, uh, I can point out a few subdivisions where I could show three more homes could be built if it wasn't for the stormwater treatment facility. And so I was really surprised that the density increased. However, I do notice that the forecast for 2012 to 2032 is the 5.4, which I feel like is accurate. It's just that uh, I, I trust the figures that staff has come up with. It's just that, I can't wrap my head around why that has happened. And then the only other issue real quick, when it comes to HB 2001, uh, we're limited to a 3% change in adding units for that. And uh, that's about 350 uh, dwelling units. And I would suggest we consider a two to, an, a, to a two and a half percent maybe because I think 3% is too high and we'll never realize that. And that was pretty much the end of my comments for the entire report, job well done staff. Heather, yeah, are you are you raising your hand? I see yeah. a hand. Yes, go ahead. I didn't know if you could, yeah, I wasn't sure. I can see you, you're, oh, okay. you're doing three other people, but then <laughs> Um. Yeah, the we'll definitely want to talk about the we you know we I think we made a comment in the report about that we can assume up to 
up to 3% additional capacity. And we didn't add that in here because that is a conversation we'll need to have at the UGB analysis. Um, okay. But yeah, we did say that. And then um, the density is, um, we did put a comment in the report and maybe we didn't emphasize it enough, but density is one of the places that we are not doing the analysis exactly the same as we did before. So I do think that it's, it did go up, um, but you know, the charts show you know, the density going up an exact percentage. And you know, that is like you know, an estimate right now. I mean, not an estimate, but like you're kind of comparing a little bit of an orange methodology to a kumquat methodology use my fruit <laughs> my fruit analogy um, because we knew that the way we did the density analysis last time wasn't sustainable and wasn't complete and so this is a little bit of a bump in the road um, and we can look at the report and make sure that we've really emphasized that you know while we're showing that there's an increase in density, um, the exact amount is probably not exactly what's shown on the charts because it's comparing two different methodologies. So I, I, yeah, I appreciate that. And obviously, you know, that wasn't highlighted enough. So um, we'll try to point that out better. Okay. Well, with that, I think we're ready to move on to recommendations. We've got three sections there. There's the overall the housing and the employment. And so uh, I guess the question for, uh, for the group is, um, do you have anything to add? Or I, I, Sue, I see your hand up. So I'll, I'll call on you in just a sec. I'm gonna, um, are we, are we, is there anything we need to be adding to the list? Is there anything we're missing, um, Sue? So I didn't get my hand up quite fast enough after Ed's comment. Oh, that's okay. Do you need to go back? <laughs> uh, but I just want to say that I think his comment is really important because one of the things that's so easy for the policymakers to do is to draw conclusions that aren't really fully informed. And Jennifer, this is not an insult, I swear. Um, it's just easy to read a report and and to look at the information and, and think you know what it means. So uh, I, th I think Ed's comment is really important and I appreciate staff's response to it. And I just wanted to tag on and say that. Thank you very much. Well, thank you. Appreciate that for sure. Heather, you're scrolling around. I'm not sure where we're going. <laughs> Sorry, I was looking to see if we talked about density in the executive summary, and we didn't. And I think that's why we didn't, because we didn't really want to highlight it, because it's a little, um, because you could take it and run with it. And um, I don't think we're, you know, prepared for that. So that's sorry for the scrolling. Now I'm back. Okay. okay, we're going to talk about recommendations. This is what we've got here. Has anybody, uh, oh, Phil, Phil has joined us. Did we expect Phil? Let the record show. Sorry, I was late joining, but the that's okay. On, it's over now, so here I am. Well, welcome. We're happy to have you. And Thanks. I should. I'm. I'm. Belated. Welcome to to Councillor Ye, who was a little bit late as well. But we do see you're all here. Um. So we're we're we are through the executive summary. We are now on to recommendations, and we're just asking if anybody has any comments, additions, subtractions, anything uh, that they want to add before we kind of finalize. And hopefully, if we can get a recommendation from this group to move this forward, uh, that's my goal uh, at the end of the meeting. So I have Sue and then Kevin. I, I think this is one of the most important sections in some ways, because 
um, you know, staff has been working on this for what, 25 or 30 years, <laughs> a long time. And your perceptions about what you want the message to be to policymakers, I think your perceptions about that are very important. And it seems like in recommendations, that's where those can fall. So it's your chance to say things to them that you really want to underscore. That's my opinion anyway. And one of the things that I think should be underscored there is about the need for uh, proactively moving towards annexation for the properties that are not annexed and not usable, even though we're kind of counting them as something we're going to use in the future. So it's just, uh, I think it's an important spot for you as staff. You're the experts. Um, and I think it's a great place for you to say those, to deliver those powerful messages. Thank you. Thanks, Sue. Kevin, then John. Again, just kind of a, um, edit, uh, editorial comment is in brackets, you, you're saying which group or which committee uh, we'll look into it or which effort will will deal with that issue. And right in that first paragraph, the lead in paragraph, you might just note that um, somehow. Oh, the deleted it. Okay. Okay, John. So I guess my question, I've got a couple of little questions. One is, who are the recommendations coming from? Is this a staff recommendation? Is this ETEC recommendation? Um, whose recommendations are these? If they're from us, I have a question. Um, so we, you're leading into the housing implement, implementation pipeline in two or three places in these recommendations. If it's coming from us, I don't know if I missed the meeting that the, did, did, we get a, did we get a presentation on the HIP? Because if we didn't, and this is coming from us, how can we recommend something that we haven't even been presented? So that, I guess it goes back to whose recommendations are these? And do we need, I don't, I didn't think that we were even going to make recommendations. Um, I think we can point out highlights, but again, I, I need to know whose recommendations these are. Yeah, so I mean, the order of operations is that the ETAC is an advisory board to staff. So staff has put together these recommendations. Um, the ETAC is advisory to staff, so we're getting your feedback in it. Um, we've talked about this before that, you know, no, it would not be ideal, but if the ETAC felt differently, um, gave us feedback that staff wasn't sure that we could go forward with, you know, that would be something we would need to um, deal with, um, right? Because that, that is definitely a possibility. Um, so, so basically then staff is making a recommendation or bringing the report to the planning commission for consideration. And um, I think then the planning commission would be making a recommendation to the city council. And um, you're right in that, you know, I think previously we thought the recommendations would be more along the line of hey, we're going faster than we thought we were. Um, and so, or that, that we have planned for. And so we need to start UGB analysis as soon as possible. Um, now we have a state mandated timeline. So we've tried to, um, I think, adjust our expectations of what those recommendations would look like. Um, no, the ETAC has did not get <laughs> a, a presentation on the HIP. Um, you're absolutely right. 
Um, but so, so okay, Heather. I, now that you've said that, I think that yeah. it can be really cleared up very easily if, under recommendations, you say something to the, to the effect that, based on all of the data we've collected here and and vetted through the ETAC staff recommendations are just so that it's clear that it's staff's recommendations, not ETAC's, res not that we overstepped our bounds and made recommendations on, on uh, ETAC. And then going forward, when it goes to planning commission, I mean, I would feel, I mean, I know that the way that it works, but Tiffany could, I mean, would you feel comfortable if the planning commission started making changes to this draft report after one or two presentations? Because I would. Oh. And so to say that planning commission is recommending this, I, I, I just, I don't know how, again, the recommendations, I need yeah. to know the hierarchy of this. Good point, John. I'll, I'll chime in after Phil. Go ahead, Phil. Um, I just have one small suggestion on language. And if you could scroll up to the next bullet point down under housing. Next page. Uh, right there. Uh, the one at the top. You know, I'm just going to suggest that you that you take a more active approach in terms of the language. So this is your recommendation. I would eliminate the words study and, and I would just say consistent with the action call for in the uh, city's HIP, prioritize the extension of capital projects. I mean, this is, uh, I, would, I would even say maybe uh, as much or uh, I respect, you know, Sue's uh, uh, recommendation about, you know, uh, we're talking about annexation, although that tends to be such a hot button issue for anybody who's not annexed in a developed area or house or whatever. So I think that the key is going to be to extend public services to those areas that need them so that we can put them into service to provide needed housing and other kind of development. That's my one suggestion for that. And I do have another question. I guess if you could go down under the last bullet point under housing, that part about consider if the number of students at the U of O continues to hold steady. So you're talking about enrollment, whether housing demand will be the same in terms of number type and densities of new units. You're talking about, I think, whether housing demand um, for kind of everybody other than students is affected by enrollment. Is that is that what you're kind of talking about there? I, I kind of got a little lost on that that last bullet point. Yeah, no, we're trying to say that if I mean um, student private student housing, um, commercial student housing is part of our housing supply. And we have seen pretty high densities um, in the downtown and around the downtown area on commercial and high density residential land um, near the university as well. And so um, if, if, for instance, U of O was projecting a severe decline in enrollment, how would that affect our overall housing demand and the densities that we would see? Um, would it? Maybe it wouldn't. I mean, maybe we would have the same demand, but um, that's what it's trying to get at. Okay. I think to me, it just seems like, and I've always struggled with this, you include student housing as part of you know, the housing supply and, and the demand. But insofar as we've been seeing this explosion of medium density and high density housing that is really catering to students. And, and it does mean that the, the percentages or, or how our, our effectiveness of being able to achieve these targets that we have are being met. 
but they're being met in student housing, not in housing for everybody other than students. And I, I think to me, that's the big takeaway that, you know, that I would, I would come away with. And I think maybe what you're trying to get at is like, hey, if enrollment does not continue to, in, to increase and or if it plateaus or drops, what does that mean of providing this kind of higher density housing in that format for anybody who's not a student? I think it's what you're kind of getting at, right? Yeah, you, yeah. you wouldn't necessarily want to project the same densities going forward on, it, on high density and commercial land if enrollment tanks when you know that a good portion of what we saw during the monitoring period um, on those lands were around the university and community industries. Or you would at least want to look deeper at the issue, I think. So we can work on the language there to make that clearer. Okay, Mark, you have your hand up. Yes, um, I think it's commendable the, to the extent to which this document as a whole and the executive summary brings up the subject of and points out the deficiencies of housing for low-income people, uh, and and also it, there is there is some mention, uh, but not a lot of examination or not any examination of homelessness. Um, but it's, it strikes me that given the magnitude of the issue for the lack of housing for low-income people, that it would be appropriate for there to be a recommendation that that's pointed directly at that. I mean, explicitly at that. Um, and probably, or it could well be that it's in here, but in kind of some, you know, guarded language that um, you know, to me, it's one of the most conspicuous issues in the city as a whole, um, partly because the homelessness, are, homeless themselves are so conspicuous, but the, the homeless are part of the problem, but even greater than that in terms of magnitude is, is the, um, the shortage of housing for people or aren't homeless but have low income. And so I'm just thinking it needs a more prominent position in, in, in something called recommendations as a whole, because it's a kind of thing that a lot of people would be looking for, I think. That's all. Well, I'm gonna say something real quick and then Ed, I'll call on you because Heather, is that, is the, is, I've had a few presentations on the HIP. Is the HIP actually, incorporate homeless um, housing. Yes. So I think that maybe is where it's like, you wouldn't know that if you read, but I think that, I mean, planning commissions had presentations on the HIP and, you know, we know council has, so I don't know, it, the, maybe a lay person wouldn't, but I don't know how you interject the, co the context that, you know, it's a reference there. And I think that that is the best you can do without having to go into lots of details. And I think it addresses what Mark is, is asking for, if I'm correct. Anyway. Yeah, I'm um, gonna break up this sentence a little bit more to really, um, to emphasize um, households with lower incomes, um, providing housing for them. Um, more housing that we have a particular particular deficit um, at, at those income ranges and even cite them because I think the analysis we did was um, for households with incomes of 25,000 or less. So we can we can expand on that and break it out a little bit. Okay. Uh, there was a hand up and then it went away. <laughs> I don't remember who. Who had uh, that was sorry. me, but you covered it. Uh, the, oh, okay. the, hip, the hip goes into homelessness in great detail. Yeah. Okay. Any last um, thoughts on housing? But not. We can move on to employment. I'm doing a time check. It's seven twelve. We still need to cover merging issues, right, Heather? Okay.
Employment. I'd be curious as, if Phil has anything to add here because I think you had the, you know, the most input when it came to the this topic. John, you have this hand up. Okay, go ahead. Um, so, to me, I, and the second bullet point, continue monitoring the effectiveness of all employment efficiency measures. I would, I would change that to continue to monitor the lack of effectiveness of our our efficiency measures because only one of the efficiency measures is actually doing any kind of of uh help with employment so i don't know if the rest of the people feel that way but for me if you read it monitoring the effectiveness sounds like it's working and when i read the data that's in this report it clearly is not working and so i would change that to continue to monitor the lack of effectiveness Bill, go ahead. Yeah, I guess, you know, I gave some sidebar comments before the meeting to Heather and Elena and, you know, kind of not to belabor it, but more or less pointing out that you need to fund these um, uh, incentives, you know, which I don't think they're fully funded. And that's one of the failings that they have. And I think that, you know, John's right, in, in my opinion, for example, um, you know, the E1 code changes, I don't think have really kind of done enough that and, and really done what people thought they would do. On the other hand, the limitations in E1, you know, more or less setting up the whole campus and the whole idea of campus industrial, I mean, is, is maybe a relic. And so I think that maybe the language that sort of says in here and what I highlighted in that middle bullet about consider other measures, I think is the that's the phrase that pays, you know, I think that's really important because I think there's other efficiency measures and or other code changes to some of those uh, employment zones that are going to be needed to make them just even more flexible than, you know, they were previously um, uh, done. So I'll leave it at that. Okay. I have one last comment and I apologize because it's actually just back into the housing, but I, um, I remembered I wrote a note here that um, the housing tools and strategies, it just, it was, it was, it was something that, um, obviously the council had initiated and we worked on all that. And I just, it, it, um, just curious if there was any mention of that, because there was a lot of tactics that were mentioned that really should be explored in my opinion. Um, and it, I don't know if, if putting something, uh, uh, you know, with continuing to explore feasible um, solutions that came out of that work. Um, I don't know. I don't know if anybody, others, and John, I think you're familiar with, with that process. Heather, go ahead. Yeah, I, you know, I struggle with these recommendations a little bit, I'll be honest, because <laughs> some of these things are things we're going to have to do anyway. Um, so whether or not they're in here or not kind of doesn't matter, right? And so when we go to the UGB analysis, we're going to have to relook at efficiency measures. We're going to have to find new ones. We're going to have to evaluate why our, you know, efficiency measures for employment haven't been used that much. Is it because of a recession or is it because it's not actually working? Is there a code amendment that could change? And so, um, so that's one thing I just want to make sure everyone's aware yeah. is that um, it is a bit tricky because it kind of felt weird not to have recommendations. But on the other hand, a lot of these things that are in there are things we're going to have to do anyway, regardless of if the report recommends it. Also, um, you know, Growth monitoring, remember, is with the UGB planning, that's the foundation, right? And so there were a lot of things in the housing tools and strategies um, and really and the HIP, you know, our more umbrella and those strategies and actions and goals are not constrained to the UGB planning process. That's why the HIP talks about homelessness 
the UGB planning process and rules don't. Not yet, they may, but they don't right now. And so there are things in housing tools and strategies that also are not required as part of UGB planning. So we, we tried to be pretty careful about only pointing to other plans that have a component that is directly related to the UGB planning. So it's tricky. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. I get that. I just, um, just thought I would mention it. So, okay. Any other thoughts, any other thoughts or revisions on this? Um, Sue, go ahead. The one thought, <clears throat> one thought I had about this is that brevity might be a real advantage. So I think when you're talking about emerging issues, having them be as short as possible is probably a good thing. Oh, on the emerging, emerging issues, okay. Let's, uh, let's get there. It's like, well, how do you know this? The very, very bottom. Okay. Okay. Anyone have any comments other than, Sue, thank you. Appreciate that. I, I, I agree with you. Brevity would be nice. I, I thought that these were good, though. They captured the discussion and the things that had, had circulated or surfaced as we were having discussion. Is there... What Heather, why is that it in some of it in green? What is that? It's a symptom of track changes. Okay. A couple of us editing it at the same time. My apologies. That's okay. I just was looking for either blue or red text and there was or black or red text and there was green. John. So when I talked earlier about the fact that I didn't want planning commission to go in and be changing this document i didn't mean that i didn't think there was a place for the planning commission to have input and i think that this area right here in emerging issues would be a great place for you to point out to the planning commission and say after you've gone through this report and with the knowledge that you have of the upcoming and landing use uh, issues that you're dealing with as planning commission can you identify any other emerging issues that we might want to put in here? I think that would be an absolutely appropriate uh, place for things from the planning commission to, to weigh in on and say, oh, have you thought about this? Or, oh, have you thought about that? As opposed to picking out data and saying, I don't know if this data should go here or this, this bullet point should go there. I think that this would be a very good appropriate place to highlight to them things that we may have missed or that that might be an emerging issue. Great point, John. Um, Dennis. Generalized, you know, emerging category and looking to staff is in terms of it might be some of that language around continuing to monitoring how incentives impact the contact development strategies in the CAP 2.0. Um, because I think that that's another policy issue that's coming into play here that's a priority for council. Um, and so um, that whole issue, particularly because this does impact, you know, the T9, T10 goals uh, that are there in the CAP 2.0 um, that are impacted by the incentives. And just recognizing that impact in another policy area that the council is engaged in. Does that make sense, Heather, where I'm kind of talking about going with that? Yep, we can add that as a um, as a bullet point specifically about the cap. And um, we might be able to pull in specific, like the specific numbers you were identifying there. Bill. In that third bullet point there, um, does it... Uh, I guess my notes were like, does it bear mentioning anything about the required housing production strategy that was is going to come up, or is it sort of implicit that that's part of the work 
that's yet to come as part of that housing needs methodology? Yeah, we can add that for sure. Um, my, my comment isn't necessarily, I don't, I don't know if it's to be here, but it's, it, it tacks on a bit to what John was saying as I think that what will be really helpful because we had this conversation, what, a couple meetings ago, um, when we started going down the rabbit hole of talking policy and we kind of, you know, pulled back and remembered that, that, that is actually going to be the role of planning commission and, city council. And so I think that um, clear direction or clear uh, expectations or, you know, kind of what you're asked, what, you know, what, what you'll be asking of planning commission when we, when you do bring this to planning commission, I think that, I think that would be really helpful. And I don't know the answer. I just think that um, they, Certainly, um, I, I feel like I don't want to speak on behalf of my colleagues, but I think that that in general, they, there's this general sense of uh, wanting to dive into what what we can do to address some of the issues that we're having around housing specifically and um, make recommendations. And so I think that just trying to maybe put that into some sort of context or package for, for planning to be condition planning commission to be able to consider. I, I just don't know if I'm, if I'm perfectly honest, I'm thinking about this information and I've, I've read it and I'm thinking that now what that, that would be my question is like, and then what do we do with it and who does what with it? So I think that that would be how I might summarize my um, thoughts about where we go from here. Yeah, we, we've been gestating this baby for the last two years, and now we get to pass it off to somebody else. And how do we do that? What is the method for giving our baby away? <laughs> Does anybody else have any comments on the emerging, emerging issues? Or the additional analysis that we're, I mean, there's a lot of info there. Just wanna make sure we've captured everything. One thing, just um, the comment about having this section be um, concise is we could also go through both the recommendations and the emerging issues and um, do like we've done in other parts of the report where we bolded key phrases, um, I think that could be helpful because um, some of this is kind of hard not to give some context to, but. And, and should it be part of the executive summary after recommendations? So we put it at the end because some of the items are specifically not things that are part of growth monitoring. And so um, we wanted it in the report to acknowledge it, that this was part of the conversation, not lose the ideas, not lose um, the things that came up, but also try to make a little bit of separation um, about the monitoring report and then these other emerging issues that may end up affect monitoring, but down the road um, because they aren't things that we're gonna do in monitoring necessarily. So that's why it's at the end. I know it's a little funky. Um, you, do you think you could make a reference to it in the executive report? Say there were um, just, just sure. like what you just said there and then point people to it. Yeah, definitely. That's a good idea. Okay, so I think that if we're if we've kind of gone through everything and we're at this point, I think what I'd like to ask this group is if we feel comfortable with the the discussion and the recommendations that we've articulated. Um, do we feel like there was anything that um, 
we wouldn't be comfortable for any reason in moving this forward, making a recommendation for uh, based on all the changes that we've talked about. Um, because if that is the case, I would definitely welcome, um, uh, you know, I, I would definitely be looking to call for a motion on, um, or looking for someone to make a motion on reading here on uh, moving the Emission Eugene Growth Monitoring Comprehensive Report forward to the Planning Commission for their considerations. And again, it will be a draft, so they will have more to add before it makes its way to council. But um, love anybody's last thoughts or a motion so that we can have discussion on that. Ed and then Sue. I make a motion that we authorize staff to uh, submit the report to the Planning Commission for their consideration. I second the motion. Okay. Motion by Sue. Thank you, Sue. Um, and Ed. Okay. Uh, is there any discussion? All right. With that, I'm going to call for a vote. So all of those in favor of moving this forward, go ahead and somehow indicate. I can see everybody at this point. Okay, I don't see anyone without their hand up who isn't staff. So um, I'll say anyone opposed or abstaining. Okay, it looks like we have a unanimous vote. So Heather and Elena, we have everything you need for this evening. <laughs> Somehow we got in just under the nick of time too. There was discussion about having representation from this body at the planning commission. Did we did we lock that down? We have not. We did talk about it though. Are you volunteering, John? Just kidding. Um, not, not at all. We were so. I think it was a question of whether or not Kevin, because I I I'm there as a planning commissioner, and I think I'm going to want to separate that role. Um, I think that that was what we discussed was that it made sense for me to sort of. Um, disassociate myself a bit with the ETAC for the purpose of that, for, of that discussion. Um, and so I think that what we discussed was that if Kevin was comfortable participating in that and being there as a resource um, for questions and anything else. So Kevin, maybe you can tell us, are you, would you be comfortable with that? Yeah, I'd be happy to do it. Okay. Do we have actually do we have a date on that? Heather? It's currently scheduled for or tentatively scheduled for April 12th. And then city council we anticipate for May sometime. Thanks. Okay. You're you're it then, Kevin. Thank what else? For that. Um, thank you, Kevin. We appreciate that. I also just have to note that Sue and Ed, I think both moved to at the same time almost, um, which are two of our original technical resource group members. So I love that they were both like, yes, move it forward. Thank <laughs> you, <Make the> baby. <laughs> yes, um, thank you. If, so there were two things we were going to um, touch base with you all on, which we can send in an email if that would work. Um, but just to let you know the things that we think are probably going to get updated in the report. Again, they're minor, but I just want to make sure that you know about them. Um, and then also just giving you a next steps update, which since we took a vote. I mean, I, I am thinking and, and the reports going to um, Planning Commission and City Council that um, we will take a couple months off of ETAC meetings and um, we'll reach out to you. We'll be emailing you along the way as the report progresses, um, but looking to come back with the ETAC in um, May or potentially June. Um, we'd like to talk about the community dashboard that we're working on, 
staff is going to start reviewing the building permits, um, mm -hmm. the rest of them from last year. So we've got a bunch, and then we need to prep for the annual report for 2022. So um, you thought you were done, but you're not. <laughs> John, you have your hand up. Yeah, I just wanted to, uh, I was wondering if, if as chair, Tiffany, you could write a, a, a letter just to acknowledge how great of work the staff has done to compile this report um, and get that to the appropriate people. I think uh, planning director, city manager, city council and mayor would be the, the people to copy on that. I yeah. think you guys have just done a fabulous job over the last many years. And it's just incredible the work that has gone into this. So I just yeah. want to acknowledge that. Absolutely. I be I would be honored to do something like that. And if you all um, give me the go ahead, I would be happy and I'm happy to route it. And you can take a look and I can um, send something on our behalf. If that works for everybody. Okay, I'll send it out since I have all of your email addresses, but I'll get a letter drafted on behalf of those of us that serve on this um, committee and we'll certainly be happy to do that. Thank you for that suggestion, Don, and for sign and volunteering me for the work. So I'm kidding. <laughs> okay, well, if that, oh, Sue, you got your hand up. Of course, I always have something else to say. If you don't have enough superlatives in your letter, <laughs> we might want to edit. I mean, this yeah. is a, this is astonishing work. It really is. It's incredible, and I really appreciate John's comment about it. Um, the amount of work that has gone into this on the staff's part, I, I I can't even imagine. Honestly, it's such a huge project, and it has so much implication for the next fifty years. Uh, at least the next 25 years. So um, yeah, I think it's really important. And you know, we say nice things about staff now and then, but I don't think we can say enough about this project. So I really appreciate that. And I, I hope you'll make it really good. Well, I will, and I'll run it, <laughs> send it out. And you all can, you all can fill it with whatever uh, information I may have failed to include, but I'll, I will do my best and I will certainly let you all review it and chime in. Thank you. We couldn't have done it without you guys. So, I mean, we, I think we told you we were going to meet once every other month. Happen. There was twice a month, so much data. Thank you so much for your volunteer time. It's huge. Oh, well, thank you. Okay, everybody, I'm gonna uh, close us out. I think we're done for the evening and we'll, I, we'll be in touch. I'll be in touch and Heather and Elena will be in touch as far as when we're gonna be getting back together um, again soon. So have a good already getting. I'm there. already getting postpartum depression. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna officially adjourn the meeting. <laughs> Good night. Great Good job, night. guys. Thank Go you. Go celebrate, oh. you guys. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, everybody.